Are you Sapper Morton? Civic number NK68514. I'm a farmer. I saw that. Your bag. It's colonial medical use. Where were you? Quanta? If you could just look up and to the left, please. <laughs> While Blade Runner and its sequel, Blade Runner 2049, have released dates separated by 35 years, and narratives taking place in 2019 and 2049 respectively, they are two films that are endlessly in conversation with one another. Through the visual references 2049 uses to hark back to the iconic original, and the reappearance of characters and certain dialogue, the most notable reoccurrence is the theme that lies at the heart of them both. While the fundamental question in these films may first appear as, can artificial intelligence be indistinguishable from humanity, both films, but especially 2049, go much deeper than this and ask the very fundamental question of, what defines humanity? A and C and T and G. The alphabet of you. I'm only two. One and zero. Half as much, but twice as elegant. Scholar Timothy Shanahan offers up a concise list of the six major philosophical questions found in Blade Runner 2049, with them being 1. What is real? 2. What can any one individual truly know? 3. What grounds a person's identity? 4. Can memories be trusted? 5. How can we make our lives meaningful through choice? And 6. What does it mean to be human? Amid all of these questions, we find the overarching theme of defining humanity. Hey guys, what's happening? Niat here with Film Comics Explained, and as requested, today we'll be exploring Blade Runner 2049. But before diving into the themes, given that Blade Runner 2049 exists in exactly the same dystopian LA as the original, I think it's important that we get up to speed on the lore and narrative behind it all. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. Based on Philip K. Dick's story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Blade Runner centers itself on Rick Deckett, a Blade Runner who's tasked with hunting down and retiring a group of potentially dangerous bioengineered humanoids known as replicants. These replicants are crafted by the Tyrell Corporation, and to keep it brief, a few major things happen. One, Deckett falls in love with Tyrell's assistant replicant Rachel. Two, the key replicant Deckett is hunting named Roy, literally meets his maker Tyrell and kills him. Three, Roy shows compassion towards Deckard by saving him before dying himself. And finally, four, Deckard runs off with Rachel, leaving behind an origami unicorn, which, for reasons we won't get into, suggests that he might well be a replicant himself. You know that Voight comp test of yours? Did you ever take that test yourself? Deckard? Jumping forward 30 narrative years, Blade Runner 2049 centers itself on an almost entirely new cast of characters. K, essentially Deckard 2.0, is a Blade Runner who knows full well he is a replicant, tasked with hunting down and retiring older replicants. And just like Deckard in the original, throughout the film, K begins to question his identity. Joy is K's only respite as his love interest. She's also an AI, but not a replicant. Instead, Joy is a commercial program that manifests itself as a holographic companion. Wallace is a new Tyrell, an ex-synthetic farming conglomerate, who now creates replicants, albeit in a far more callous way than Tyrell ever did. For Wallace, replicants are little but engineered slaves, far from human. Love is Wallace's muscle, a combat replicant who does all the legwork, acting as the film's main antagonist. And finally, Deckard makes his way back in, though after years of isolation in a now wholly desolate Las Vegas. The film starts off with Kay doing what he's made to do, retire old Nexus 6 models, yet here he encounters something more, a buried chest that contains human remains. Taking these back to his police headquarters, they discover that these were the bones of Deckard's replicant partner Rachel, and more worryingly, it appeared that she was pregnant. Kay is then tasked with finding and killing the child to cover up the thought that replicants might be capable of reproducing, something destined to fracture a world that struggles with accepting skin jobs as anything other than robotic subhuman slaves. 
But this strikes a chord for Kay, who exclaims, I've never retired something that was born before. Soon Wallace gains word of the pregnant replicant, turning the search into a race whereby the establishment wants the child destroyed and Wallace wants it for testing. Finding a lead at a distant orphanage, Kay's information only leads him to a dead end. But while at the orphanage, he comes across a familiar sight, a furnace where one of his implanted memories took place. Reliving the memory, Kay finds a small horse statuette he hid within the memory, suggesting that perhaps he is the replicant child who was born, not made. A trip to the Dream Maker confirms that Kay's memory is in fact real, but whether it is his memory or an implanted memory from another is still unclear. If you have authentic memories, you have real human responses. Wouldn't you agree? Back home, Joy merges with a physical replicant prostitute to show Kay physical affection, resulting in the pair deciding to shift Joy's interface from one built into the home into a handheld device that lets her travel around freely. But if the device is destroyed, so is she. I'm coming with you, but not like this. If anything happens to this, that's it. You're gone. Yes. Like a real girl. Kay and Joy head off into the desert to find Deckard, who reveals he was indeed the father of the replicant child, but that his part was to leave it upon birth so that it had a better chance of survival. Sadly, their conversation is cut short by Love, who comes in with a bang, takes Deckard, knocks Kay out cold, and, in an emotional low, kills Joy by trading on the transponder. Fortunately, Kay is scooped up by some scavengers, who reveal themselves to be replicants forming a rebellion against humanity, all unified by the story of the replicant child. Yet the oldest and wisest among them, who's missing her identifying right eye, reveals that the child was a girl. This shatters all of Kay's thoughts that he was the unique being, pushing him back to being just a replicant made with a purpose. In the final act, Wallace intimidates Deckard and waxes lyrical while showing him a remade version of Rachel, who's quickly obliterated after Deckard reveals that her eyes were the wrong color. Deckard is then set to be moved off to world for torture, but Kay intercepts the transports, killing Love and freeing Deckard in the process. They then return to the most well-known dream maker there is named Staline, who's revealed to be Deckard's replicant child. Meanwhile, Kay lies down in the soft snow as the tune Time to Die from the original film rings out. Kay is left knowing that while he's a replicant, he defied his purpose to follow orders and kill the child, and in exhibiting such free will and personal choice, does he not make himself human? The world of Blade Runner 2049 is one which no longer distinguishes humanity by class, race, or creed. The divide which matters is between those who were born human and those who were created as replicants. From those working alongside Kay to those he lives near, it's clear that almost everyone considers him lesser. Fuck off, skin job. Not only this, but as a Blade Runner, Kay also finds himself outcast by replicants, seeing as his only job is to kill them while abiding to Deckard's ideology from the first film. Replicants are like any other machine. They're either a benefit or a hazard. If they're a benefit, it's not my problem. But while Kay finds himself marginalized, he also is willing to take responsibility for his actions. From his early queries about never having retired anything that was born before, to his later decisions driven by him questioning his own identity, Kay interacts with the world in a seemingly different register to almost all the other characters. Blade Runner 2049, like Blade Runner before it, is a film of colossal systems which stamp out the individual, leaving them only a speck in an overwhelming metropolis that is surrounded by a decaying world. For example, Kay's boss Lieutenant Joshi finds herself working under a system in order to maintain the status quo, essentially making herself a slave to the greater system. And within this world, there's a clear hierarchy. At the top, humans find themselves dominant, with AI and the new Nexus 8 models like Kay being used as slaves and machines to do their bidding. And at the very bottom of the pile lie the Nexus 6 models, those which are being hunted down and destroyed. But at this point, we have to ask what differentiates all these categories? After all, as an audience, we find it very difficult to identify replicant from human. This forces us to ask the question, what really defines humanity? The film offers four key categorical answers, physicality, memory, the soul, and action. As Kay scans through DNA trying to find the orphan child, Joy comments that her body is not made up of DNA, but simply ones and zeros. A comment which throws into question the differentiation between replicants and humans, as both are crafted from DNA, somewhat distancing replicants from pure programmatic beings such as Joy. 
Even the one yet unbroken divide is shattered in 2049, with the knowledge that a replicant can even give birth to a child. Such an act makes the physical differentiation between replicants and humans almost indistinguishable, seeing as both function virtually identically, while also retaining the same outer shell. While replicants and humans have always been practically indistinguishable, replicant eyes have always been a dead giveaway. Whether this be in the form of the Void Camp test in the original film, or the barcodes we now find on the right eye of each Nexus 8, eyes offer us a physical window into whether someone is human or not. This aligns with the biblical proverb stating that eyes are the window to the soul. This leads us onto the idea of a soul. Souls have long been a significant part of humanity, defining humans against demons and being that one immaterial part of a human being which is immortal. K defines the criteria for having a soul when he mentions To be born is to have a soul, I guess. Suggesting that replicants lack souls, but of course, a soul is not quite as simple as that. Across the many continents, countless religions have posited differing versions of what a soul means that it's hardly a unified criterion that can be used to define humanity. Instead, in the original Blade Runner, Pris opts for a simple and more recognizable criteria. Descartes, I think, therefore I am. But this phrase is nowhere near as straightforward as it once seemed. Instead, it's endlessly problematized by artificial intelligence which can think. For example, in Blade Runner we have K, a replicant, and Joy, a program, and many computational interfaces which provide verbal feedback. Where is the line between thinking and being here? Is Joy human in this regard? Is K? When created, replicants are implanted with synthetic memories in order to help them feel more human by giving them a history. The memory maker in the film explains, And if you have authentic memories, you have real human responses. What is fascinating about K in this regard is that he acknowledges his memories are synthetic, yet still holds them dear. Someone left this, yes. In the 20th century, Jean Baudrillard suggested that human memories are simply a series of images which we look back on and define ourselves against. In such a way, it's obvious why the replicants are provided with foundational memories. But the question that 2049 asks isn't about the importance of memory. After all, the original film covered this extensively. Instead, 2049 questions, how do we tell the difference between genuine memories and those that are implanted? The answer provided by the memory maker is that we feel. But even this is thrown into question with modern psychology, like the famous Lost in the Mall study helmed by Loftus and Pickrell, which showed that 37% of participants would report remembering events which had never happened when prompted. Thus, up to now, we have gained few answers. In Blade Runner 2049, it's clear that the physical boundary between replicant and human is almost nil. The question of a soul is wayward and unfocused, and the idea of memory is compromised by nobody being able to truly know whether a memory was theirs or not. For Jean-Paul Sartre, humanity is unique due to it being one of the only beings whose existence precedes essence. He explains this through the fact that, first of all, man exists, turns up, appears on the scene, and, only afterwards, defines himself. In such a way, we all define ourselves as individual agents through our action in the world. But this isn't the case for replicants. Replicants are made for a purpose. Joy is made to be an AI for a lonely man. Love is made to be Wallace's muscle. K is made to be a Blade Runner. Going further back, we also see this in the 1982 film, with Roy and Pris explicitly being labelled as combat and pleasure models respectively. In other words, replicants appear as an essence and then come into existence. They are made for a purpose. However, this isn't quite as simple as it seems. Taking this at face value, K's essence is to kill old Nexus models. However, he explicitly overcomes this goal, consistently lying to his superiors about goals being achieved, and even going so far as to side with the replicants. In this way, K's essence appeared less predetermined than the humans who created him had hoped, with him being able to take agency in order to make complex decisions which go against his purpose in the world. This leads to K and those like him who define their own actions to pass as human by Sartre's standards. This leads us back to the overarching question, what really defines humanity? Throughout 2049, it's evident that K rides the fine line between humanity and replicant. But considering all the other characters at hand, it appears most of the world struggles with that divide. 
Lieutenant Joshi is only a component in a system, forced to work towards certain goals which don't necessarily abide by her morality, because they're for society. Meanwhile, Joy, the most obvious AI in the film, displays some of the most human tics, leaning towards love, sensation, touch, and tenderness more than any other character on screen. Where one places the divide of humanity is likely to be a very personal affair, but for me, Kay appears human while Joy is decisively not. But even such a divide is hard to pinpoint beyond the knee-jerk feeling that beings that are not physical cannot be human. However, underneath the question of what qualifies as human lurks a much larger question that Blade Runner 2049 quietly deposits into our minds. Is humanity even a good metric? Consider this, if replicants like Kay or the countless others we see in the film act on intuition, cognition, and morality, does that not make the traits that we commonly associate with humanity not at all unique to humans? Even drawing this idea back to the real world, when we see animals showing each other compassion, care, or acting in moral, rational, or cognitive ways, we denote them as exhibiting human behaviors. But perhaps this simply reveals the fact that using the word human in such a way is simply inflating our self-importance. After all, both in the world of Blade Runner and the world we all inhabit, we're clearly not the only beings capable of emotion or intelligence beyond ourselves. Thus, while Blade Runner poses some interesting questions about the humanity of artificial intelligence, as defined through physicality, the soul, memory, and action, perhaps it's important for us to cast the net wider, asking ourselves whether the human race really has a monopoly on what we call humanity.